Let me pray and we'll, we'll get started. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for another Lord's Day, for a day in which your uh, mercies are new, in which your people can gather together uh, to rest in your power, to rest in your presence, to rest in your promises. God, as we look this morning at uh, your promises in Scripture, as we look at uh, the covenants in which you made uh, with your people. I pray that you would bless our time together, that you would transform us by the renewal of our mind. Um, and that uh, you'd be glorified in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Alright, so uh, this is our uh, last week of our, our doctrinal distinctives uh, as a church. And again, the, the first one we did, uh, or that you guys did with Pastor Luke, was... Uh, that we are confessional, right? And he talked about the Westminster Confession of Faith. And uh, there, there's a pastor uh, one time who said um, that he, he compared the, or used this analogy or this, this imagery um, when talking about um, being confessional. And he talked about the moon and the sun. And if you look at the moon, uh, the moon in and of itself has really no beauty. It's a dried up rock. But when we look at the moon, you think of a full moon, right, in the middle of the night, uh, how beautiful it looks. It's beautiful because it reflects the sun. And so confessions are only beautiful, they're only true, insofar as they reflect what the Word says. In and of themselves, they're, they're words on paper. But when they reflect what Scripture says, when they reflect what the Word of God says, uh, that's, that's where their beauty comes from. That's where their truth comes from. So that, that's, why, that's why we love uh, confessions, uh, because of what they say about the Word of God. And we looked at Calvinism last week, right? We just really looked at God's sovereignty and God's glory in salvation. Um, that's, that's what we talked about. Uh, so this week, we're going to talk about covenant theology. Covenant theology. Um, my, my hope is that I would clearly define what covenant theology is for you, uh, explain why it's important, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk briefly, I'm really going to skim through what the actual covenants are in scripture and, and unfold that a little bit, uh, but this will just give you guys an understanding of what covenant theology is if you don't have that already. Uh, Pastor Josh has done Sunday school classes on covenant theology, and so if you want a more in-depth study, uh, I'm pretty sure all those are on YouTube, so you can go on there find uh, any of those classes that he's done on covenant theology. So, what is covenant theology? Uh, the answer to this question will not only tell us what covenant theology is, uh, but why we ought to study it. J.I. Packer defines covenant theology in this way. He says, the straightforward, if provocative, answer to that question is that it is what we call nowadays hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. That is a way of reading the whole Bible that is itself a part of the overall interpretation of the Bible that it undergirds. So all he's saying is what covenant theology is, is it's how we read Scripture. That's what he's saying. How we interpret Scripture. And he calls it hermeneutic. So hermeneutics is, is simply the, the art and science of biblical interpretation. When we open the pages of the Bible and we say, what does this mean here? Uh, we're doing hermeneutics, right? We're, we're interpreting scripture, and there's right ways to do that and wrong ways to do it. And what J.R. Packer says is covenant theology is, is a hermeneutic. It's, it's how we interpret scripture. Uh, it's important to understand that, that covenant theology is not something that we impose on scripture. It's not something that we look at scripture and say, okay, where can I find covenant theology here? It's something that Scripture imposes on itself. It's something that Scripture presses upon its readers. So as we open the pages of Scripture, uh, covenant theology is not something we look for, but it's the very outline, it's the very text of Scripture that we're seeing. And so covenant theology is the very framework of Scripture, uh, and it gives us an understanding of how to read the Bible. We see this in the book of Psalms, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, they both structure the history of redemption covenantally, and we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, it is the Bible's way of explaining 
what it's about. Covenant theology is at the very heart of our understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ, of the gospel of salvation, of redemptive history, and of the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. The assurance of salvation, the church, the sacraments, the Christian life, and much more are all rooted in covenant theology. Right? So, so again, what we're seeing is, is in covenant theology, all we're talking about is that as we look at scriptures, we look at the whole of scripture, covenant theology is, is how we unpack that. Covenant theology is, is the structure in which all that is presented to us in God's word. So covenant theology, in a way, is a blending of biblical, and systematic theology, right? So I know, I know I'm using a lot of uh, bigger terms or more uh, terms that I guess have uh, broader definitions, uh, but biblical theology seeks to understand the progressive unfolding of God's special revelation throughout history. Or in other words, biblical theology seeks to understand redemptive history as a whole, by observing the historical and chronological unfolding of it. So what biblical theology does is it, it looks at all of history, redemptive history, meaning how God has chosen to save his people throughout uh, when God created us till he brings us to glory, uh, how that unfolding takes place. And biblical theology looks at it from a historical and chronological unfolding. Systematic theology seeks to present the entire scriptural teaching on a certain specific truth or doctrine, one at a time. It does this by observing what scripture says as a whole about the particular doctrine, uh, and then observing how that doctrine relates to other doctrines in scripture, and how that doctrine is applied to today's context. So, I'll give you an example, hopefully flesh this out a little bit. Uh, the doctrine of the atonement. Jesus atoning for our sins or, or paying for our sins, the doctrine of the atonement. Biblical theology will look at a specific era recorded in scriptures, so let's say the patriarchal period, uh, and ask what can we learn about the atonement during that era? And then it might move forward to the Mosaic period and ask uh, the same questions and so on. So it's going to go through scripture, uh, through the different eras of scripture, right, chronologically and, and Historically, it's going to ask that same question. Systematic theology will look at the whole Bible and ask those questions about the atonement. And it's going to say, how does the atonement relate to the other truths in Scripture? How does the atonement, uh, can, how can that be applied to today's context? Right? So not just looking at a specific time uh, and moving, again, chronologically through Scripture, but systematic theology is going to take the whole of Scripture and say, how does it connect to all of these? How can we connect all of these dots? So, covenant theology, covenant theology, that's the blending of these two. It is the scripture's own progressive unfolding of redemptive history through covenants, biblical, that's biblical theology, that also relates to specific doctrines that we find throughout scripture, so that, uh, uh, to that covenantal unfolding that we see in redemptive history, it's systematic. And this is what we see Jesus do when he talks about the atonement himself. So in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples explaining his coming death, the atonement. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Mark 14, 24, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Luke 22, 20, this cup that is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood. So how does Jesus explain his coming death? Covenantally. Right? So this is the new covenant. This is my covenant. And so uh, what he's doing is he's word for word, almost word for word, Jesus is quoting from Exodus 24, 8, which is dealing with the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant. So Exodus 24, 8 says, And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the only difference that we really see is Jesus adds the word my, uh, recorded in Matthew and Mark, and the word new, recorded in Luke. 
Jesus is putting flesh on what he says in John 5.39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. In the upper room, uh, what Jesus is doing is he's telling his disciples and us that to properly understand his death, the, the atonement, we need to understand the covenant God made with Moses. We need, we need to see that uh, throughout history, um, God has unfolded his plan of salvation. That God made a covenant with Moses. And we need to understand that all of these covenants with Abraham, with Noah, with David, all of these things ultimately will point to Christ. And so to properly understand the atoning work of Christ, we need to understand the historical and the chronological unfolding of what we see in Scripture regarding the ademption of, excuse me, the atonement, uh, as revealed through the covenants. And so the theme of covenants is the very fabric of Scripture. And we see that woven throughout the text. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, The doctrine of the covenant lies at the root of all true theology. It has been said that he who well understands the distinction between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace is a master of divinity. I am persuaded that most of the mistakes which men make concerning the doctrines of Scripture are based upon fundamental errors with regard to covenants of law and covenants of grace. And so it would follow to properly understand the Scriptures, we need to understand what a covenant is. What a covenant is. So, covenants are, are a pretty foreign concept to today's culture. We don't really use covenantal language much uh, in our culture today. Um, so, or, or at least if we do, that the concept of it is, is misunderstood or misapplied. So the Hebrew word for covenant is bereath, and the Greek word is uh, diatheke. I think is how you said it. Don't speak Greek, but we'll go with that. Uh, we are not going to uh, be doing a big word study on these, but what I want you to see is uh, that I'm going to give this general definition, which I think is going to capture... Uh, what a covenant is, both under the Hebrew word and, and that Greek word. I'll kind of combine, combine the two. And so a covenant, generally speaking, generally speaking, is a conditional promise made between two or more parties. A conditional promise made between two or more parties. It's first important to note that a covenant does not create the relationship between the parties, but it affirms it. It affirms it. So covenants don't they don't make relationships. Again, if it's a conditional promise between two or more parties, it does not create a relationship. What it does is it defines the parameters of that relationship. It defines the parameters of that relationship. The parties involved may be equal or, or there may have a superior, inferior relationship. Uh, a covenant is a conditional promise that the parties involved are saying, I will do this and you will do that. Uh, that's Broadly speaking, or generally speaking, that's what a covenant is. I will do this, you will do that. It is a promise that is conditioned or dependent upon the parties fulfilling their obligations as defined by their agreement. Right? So we have this relationship, we make an agreement, you do this, I'll do that. And so now, it's, it's a promise conditioned on me fulfilling my end of the promise and you fulfilling your end of the promise. It binds us together. It binds the parties together. It defines the terms of our involvement with one another. It also serves to secure that involvement. It binds us. The securing of this special relationship can be accomplished either through the mutual trust already present in this relationship or through the promise of blessing if the conditions are kept or the threat of punishment if the conditions are broken. So, taking this definition, it's easy to see examples of this in everyday life, right? Marriage, uh, in the workplace, church, government, so on. We can see the idea of covenant weave throughout our entire lives. So, um, there's tons of examples in Scripture. Um, one of them, I think this is a, a good one to see, mainly because what it's going to do, hopefully, is it's going to help you to see how important the idea of covenants is.
within Scripture and how impactful they actually are uh, to what unfolds in Scripture. So in Joshua 9, in Joshua chapter 9, Joshua is leading Israel in fulfilling God's command to kill all of the inhabitants of the land uh, that they were to possess. And the uh, inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua and Israel had been doing, and they were scared. So, if you remember what they did, uh, they, they tricked Joshua. They tricked him and the other leaders of Israel into not killing them. The Gibeonites make themselves look poor, and then they come to all the leaders and say, we are from a very, very, very far away country. But we have heard about your God and what you are doing. And because we are not around here, we're no threat to you. Make a covenant with us and let us live. And so Joshua and the other leaders of Israel make the covenant with the Gibeonites. And then three days later, find out that they were tricked. Now the people of Israel uh, are mad at their leaders uh, that they got tricked. Uh, they want to go kill the Gibeonites. But Joshua and the other leaders say to them, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live. Lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. So they make this promise. They make essentially a covenant with the Gibeonites. <clears throat> but the story doesn't end there. What we see, fast forward, 400 years later. 400 years later. So this, this event takes place, right? Joshua does not fulfill uh, the commands that God had given, really the covenant made with him on what he ought to do uh, in taking of the land. 400 years, late, 400 years later, in 2 Samuel 21, there had been a famine in the land for three years. David asked God, why is this happening to the people of Israel? Why, why this famine? And what was God's response? God answered David by saying, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So 400 years later, God's still taking that covenant seriously that was made uh, by Joshua. So God let his wrath fall on Israel because they broke the covenant that was made with the Gibeonites 400 years prior. So do you remember what I said about covenant theology? Uh, being practical for the assurance of salvation, right? It applies to all these doctrines that we have, that we look at in Scripture. The Gibeonites weren't even God's people. Yet he was faithful to not only remember the covenant that Israel had made with them, but he was also faithful to administer punishment, uh, the punishment required for breaking that covenant. So how much more, how much more assurance should we have knowing that this same God has made a covenant with us and that he will be faithful to keep his promises. Hebrews 6, 13-20, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes and oath, is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before. We have this as sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what we see there in Hebrews 6 is God saying, I, I made a promise, and I will fulfill that promise. I will bring it to its completion. And we see that over and over and over in Scripture. And so I want to now narrow our definition, right, more than just a promise between two or more parties. I want to narrow our definition of what a covenant is. And this definition will help us to better understand things like Hebrews 6 that we just read and hopefully other passages in Scripture. The definition of covenant that I want to use uh, 
uh, comes from O. Palmer Robertson, uh, wrote a book called The Christ of the Covenants, very good book, I think, to, uh, for an introduction to covenant theology. And he says this, uh, a covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A bond in blood sovereignly administered. So a bond is an agreement that binds people together. So just like we saw in our broader definition of an agreement between two or more parties, that's what this bond is. It binds people together. In the biblical covenants that we see, uh, this is the binding of God to man. When God makes a covenant with somebody, this agreement, this promise, this binding, is God binding himself to man. This relationship between God and man already exists before the covenant is even established. But a covenant does define the conditions of this relationship, and it also secures the relationship. The securing of this special relationship between God and man is accomplished through the promise of life and blessing, if the conditions are kept, and the threat of death or curse, if the conditions are broken. And uh, this is what is meant by a bond in blood. So remember, it's a bond in blood sovereignly administered. So a bond in blood, it is a bond of life and death. Blood is the sign of life, Leviticus 17.11. And when we talk about the shedding of the blood of goats and bulls for sacrifices or the blood of Jesus that has been shed, what we're talking about is the taking of life. We're talking about uh, death. If you keep the conditions of the covenant, you will live. If you break the conditions, you will die. This life and death aspect of the covenants is seen most vividly in the, in the inauguration of a covenant. And so what we'll see, the phrase that's often translated in Scripture as to make a covenant, right? so God makes a covenant, uh, is actually literally, <clears throat> should literally read, to cut a covenant. To cut a covenant. And uh, we see this clearly in Genesis 15. When God makes or cuts a covenant with Abraham, Abraham divides different uh, types of animals by cutting them in half and making a sort of aisle way to be walked through. And then God, symbolized by the smoking oven and the burning torch, he passes through these divided animals. And this act of cutting a covenant, uh, it's essential to the understanding of what's being promised. It's essentially a commitment to die if the conditions of the covenant are not kept. So when parties would do that, I uh, think just uh, uh, man and man, so not God and man, but man and man, what they're saying is if I break this, if I don't fulfill my end, right? Remember, you do this, I do this. If I don't fulfill my end, what happened to these animals? Let that happen to me. And so what God's saying in the Abrahamic covenant, when, when, when God... Again, symbolized through the smoking oven and the burning torch, passes through these animals. What God says is, let that be to me also. Um, but can God die? Absolutely not. And so what God is saying is, I, th this covenant will never be broken. I will fulfill this promise that I am making to Abraham, uh, and nothing can stop me. Nothing can stop me. So it is essentially, uh, again, a commitment to that promise. Uh, there are other places in Scripture where we see this language used uh, to describe the inauguration of man to man or by God to man or man to God. Uh, and this language is also used throughout ancient languages uh, and, and near Eastern cultures. We see this language over and over used throughout history. So, covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. Sovereignly administered. So sovereignty is the supreme rule or authority. God is in complete rule and control. And nothing happens without him actively or, or passively causing it to happen. In the context of covenants, God dictates the terms of the covenant. When God binds himself to man, he alone, he alone determines the conditions of that covenant. So that, that's what a covenant is. A covenant is a bond in blood solemnly ministered. It's God binding himself to man. And in this binding, it's, it's a binding of life and death. Life if the conditions of the covenant are kept, 
death if they are broken. And it is God who sets the terms, not man. So, uh, we're going to dive into, very briefly, the different biblical covenants. Right? So we've looked at what covenant theology is, the idea of covenants within Scripture, uh, or at least defining it. And now I want to look at the specific covenants. I'm going to use certain terms, uh, certain, uh, um, I guess, titles for these covenants. Uh, just know that uh, in different books and different teachings, people use different terminology to define what these covenants are. But really the principles are the same. The idea behind those covenants are the same. Uh, there just might be a difference in wording. So, what are the covenants that God has made that we see in Scripture? Uh, there's three major covenants that we see. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, or you might hear that called the covenant of creation, and the covenant of grace. Covenant of grace. So the covenant of redemption. This is the agreement between the persons of the Trinity regarding a plan of salvation that has existed for all of eternity. And this covenant is the very foundation for all other biblical covenants. So, no artists here. But if we have the uh, covenant, I'm just going to shorthand it, of redemption, from this, all of Scripture, all of the other covenants are going to start coming out of that. So as we understand the covenant of redemption and what God has promised to do from eternity past, as Scripture unfolds, we start seeing more and more of what that plan entailed. And we looked at this uh, last week. I read this passage, Ephesians 1, 4 through 10. This really explains uh, what this covenant is. But what we are going to see is that this covenant language uh, or excuse me, the language of covenant is not used in this passage. And you will see that in other ones. As an example, the Davidic covenant, which we'll cover here in a minute, uh, when God makes that covenant with David, the word covenant is not used. But then elsewhere in Scripture, it's referred to as a covenant. So just because it doesn't say, and God made a covenant, uh, if the, the idea of covenant is there, bond and blood sovereignly administered, if the idea is there, then the idea of covenant is present. So, um, <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 4 through 10. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So in the covenant of redemption, each person of the Trinity has a distinct role. The Father promises to prepare a son a body, Luke 1.35, Hebrews 10.5. Give the Son the Spirit without measure, Isaiah 43.1 and 2, Isaiah 61.1. Always support and comfort the Son, Isaiah 42.1 through 7, Isaiah 49.8. Deliver the Son from the power of death, Psalm 2. Bring the Son all whom the Father had given, John 6, 39 and John 17, 9 and 24. And he also promised to give the Son a number of redeemed that no one could number. Psalm 22, 27 and Psalm 72, 17. The Son promises to assume human nature, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Hebrews 2, 10, 11, 14 and 15. To be under the law, to place himself under the law, Psalm 48, uh, 40, verse 8, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Philippians 2, 5 and 8. And the Son also promised to bear the sins of his people, Isaiah 53, 12, John 10, and 1 Peter 2, and Acts 2. The Holy Spirit promises to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, uh, John 16, 8. To dwell within the believer, Romans 8, 11. 
to seal the salvation of those who are saved, Ephesians 1.13. Teach believers, John 14.26. Anoint believers, 1 John 2.27. To guide believers, John 16.13. And to sanctify believers, 1 Peter 1.2. So, I know there's a lot. But what I'm trying to show is that each person of the Trinity had not only promised to do these things, but also fulfilled them. Also held up their end of that promise. And that promise was not just made between that person of the Trinity and people. It was made within the God. That's what we see in Ephesians 1, 4 through 10. Those promises were made before the foundations of the world. And then they came to fruition uh, throughout human history. So each person of the God had had a distinct role in saving uh, his people. Quick note on that. Some theologians will say that that was not a covenant if you use the definition that I first gave of a bond and blood sovereignly administered. Because the blood aspect, the life and death, right? Uh, so take the general definition. A, an agreement between, a promise between two or more parties, right? Two or more parties. So uh, you still have an aspect of covenant. But you do see, even though you don't see it in Ephesians, you see as God makes these covenants to man, this same covenant of redemption, the same promise that was made before the foundations of the world, as you see that unfold throughout redemptive history, you do see God binding himself to this life and death aspect of the covenant. And so, even though you don't see it in that particular passage, uh, you do see God binding himself to it in that way. So that's a covenant of redemption. Covenant of works, uh, this one often gets uh, flack for the, the terminology. That's why I gave that sort of parentheses of or covenant of creation. Uh, because what people will say is um, that it, it, it wasn't all works. Obviously, God was being gracious, and so we're not denying God's grace in this covenant. Uh, we're just saying that the basis of the covenant, the very foundation of it, of what God was asking or what God was requiring of man, revolved around that works. Component. So, covenant of works is the covenant of God made with man before the fall. Before the fall. So, think Adam and Eve. Uh, God makes this covenant with him. And the language of, of works is used to emphasize this testing or probationary period that was given to Adam. And so, <clears throat> the substance of it, again, is not that there's no grace. But what it is, is just saying that God had bound himself to man, right? He makes his covenant with Adam, and that covenant revolves around uh, sort of this testing or probationary period, this works period. Um, and then what we see after the fall is the covenant of grace, what we call the covenant of grace. And that's going to represent God's relationship with his people now after sin has entered the world. It is a general term used to describe the progressive unfolding of God's plan to save his people for himself throughout redemptive history. So this progressive unfolding is seen in, in six different covenants. So this is where we'll get into really the sort of nitty-gritty or the details of covenant theology. When you hear of covenant theology, um, these are the covenants that you'll generally hear of. Right? So there's three big ones, the covenant of redemption, works, and now covenant of grace. Now what we're going to see is the unpacking of those. Uh, so again, from the covenant of redemption, then we hit the covenant of, of works, and now the covenant of grace. And now, Scripture just explodes with these six different covenants. So, the Adamic covenant, the, the covenant made with Adam, or the covenant of uh, commencement in Genesis 3. That's the first one. So, God's covenant with Adam. The Noahic covenant, or the covenant of preservation. And that's in Genesis 8 and 9. So, the Adamic covenant the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, or the covenant of promise, which we looked at a little bit earlier, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17, the Mosaic covenant, or the covenant of law, uh, and that's seen in Genesis 19 through 24, the Davidic covenant, uh, or the covenant of the kingdom, and we see that in 2 Samuel 7, and then our last one is the new covenant, the new covenant. The covenant of consummation. And that's seen in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 37, Mark 26, Mark 14, 
Luke 22, and then really the entire book of Hebrews, you see that uh, unfolding of the new covenant. So, uh, what I want to look at now, so just to hit those again so you can understand how that's unfolding in Scripture, you have the, uh, the covenant made with Adam in Genesis 3. The covenant made with Adam after the fall. And then as Scripture continues to unfold, you see then the covenant made with Noah. Right? We still get reminders of that covenant every time we see a rainbow outside. We see the covenant with Noah. After that, we see the covenant made with Abraham. And then we see the covenant made with, with Moses, and then with David, and then we see the consummation of all those, all those brought together in the new covenant. And so I want to look at the unity and, and discontinuity um, before we wrap up of the covenant. So you can see how, even though there's six different covenants unfolding, um, how they really all tie together. So although the substance of the covenants, the substance of them are different from each other in a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways that they differ. There's a unity that they share. The covenant of redemption, again, the covenant of redemption is the tree that all the other covenants branch off of. Not my best tree, but you guys get it. Uh, it all the branch off from that covenant of redemption. The branches may, uh, of the tree may vary in size and shape and in other ways, but they all started from the same seed. They're all part of that same tree. The covenants are the same. Uh, they, they, they may vary in who they apply to. They may vary in what conditions are set upon man, but they all come from the covenant of redemption, God's plan to save his people. The branches of a tree also make the tree itself more visible. If you can imagine, um, if this was actually a, a decent looking tree, as the branches grow, just think of a tree outside. Uh, as the branches grow, this tree gets bigger and the, the leaves become more full. That tree becomes more visible, right? You can see, if you take a step back, you can see the whole tree for itself, right? So, <clears throat> As the branches grow and the tree matures, it becomes easier to see. We, we get to see the covenant of redemption, God's plan to save his people, more clear. And as each covenant progressively unfolds throughout redemptive history and throughout Scripture, God's plan to save his people for himself uh, becomes more visible. So once we understand this, covenant theology and the Bible as a whole start to make a lot more sense. And what we need to understand is God's plan for redemption does not unfold from, we have covenant of redemption here, and then we have the covenant of works, and then the covenant of grace, and then God tried it with Adam, didn't quite work out. Noah, we'll, we'll try something different here. Okay, we'll do Abraham. He's not cutting it. So then we got Moses. Let's do David now. Okay, now we need uh, Christ in the, the new covenant um, to actually bring all this together. So then we have sort of God's plan A, B, C, D, so on, right? That's not what the covenants are. It's not, a, it's not God made a plan A, and now I guess we got to go to plan B because plan A didn't work out. This is all plan A. All of this is plan A. From the covenant of redemption, from eternity past, before the foundations of the world, when God set out to save a people for himself, what we see throughout Scripture and throughout redemptive history is that one plan, plan A, unfolding. It's unfolding throughout redemptive history. So as you flip through the pages of Scripture, and you're reading stories in Genesis and Exodus, and you get to Judges, and you're reading Joshua, and then you flip to Hebrews, it's all part of the same story. All God is doing is, throughout these covenants, He's making that tree more full. Right? He's giving us more visibility. He's helping us to see what He had predestined all along. What He had planned to do from before the foundations of the world. And so, we can't cut off branches of the tree or we will lose its fullness. If we start taking some of these out, we say, well, that one's not important, or this one's not important. 
we lose the fuller picture, the big picture of what God uh, had promised to do for his people. And so, uh, O. Palmer Robertson, who I quoted earlier, he says this, the covenant structure of scripture manifests a marvelous unity. God, in binding himself, never changes. And for this reason, the covenants of God relate organically to one another. From Adam to Christ, a unity of covenantal administration characterizes the history of God dealing with his people. So what Robertson is saying is, because God never changes, because God never changes, there's a marvelous unity in all of these covenants. Because God stays the same, although people change, although people break the covenant, Although people sin against God and rebel against God, God never changes. And he is faithful, although we are unfaithful. And so God, because he is unchanging, these, these covenants are unified uh, because God will see this covenant of redemption to its end. And we see this unity, really, Scripture speaks uh, of this unity itself. In Ezekiel 37, uh, this is where, where we will close out. Um, Ezekiel 37, verses 24 through 27. I think this is one of the coolest passages in Scripture because of that concept, because of what we see in God's unfolding plan uh, of, of redemption. Ezekiel 37, verses 24 through 27. He says this, My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. The, the Davidic covenant. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. Abrahamic covenant. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Back to the Davidic covenant. I will make a covenant... Oh, sorry, I skipped the verse tonight. Right before what I just read about the Abrahamic covenant, he says, uh, they shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. Uh, the Mosaic covenant. So I apologize. So he goes, Davidic, uh, Mosaic, Abrahamic, back to the Davidic covenant. And then he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. New covenant. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this passage unites the different covenants as one. And this, this illuminates a principle uh, that unites them all. Again, the faithfulness of God. God's unchanging character. In verse 27, he says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We call this, O. Palmer Robertson calls this, the Emmanuel Principle. The Emmanuel Principle. Which says, at the heart of the covenant, at the heart of all of these, is the declaration that God is with us. That he will be our God and we will be his people. And it is this principle that binds all of scripture together. From Genesis to Revelation. And Jesus uh, is the embodiment of this principle. John 1.14 And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, then, is the unifying focus of all of Scripture, and more specifically, the covenants. God from eternity past promised that he would be our God and we would be his people. And Jesus embodies that when he comes in the flesh to unify his people uh, with himself. Let me pray, and then uh, I will open up to questions. Father God, thank you. Uh, for your faithfulness. You are a loving God, a gracious God. God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you that...
your, your promise to save the people for yourself. Your plan for redemption is not dependent upon our faithfulness. It's not dependent upon what we have done, what we are doing, or what we will do. But it's dependent upon you. It's dependent upon the work that you would do. That you would do in us and that you would do through your son in his life, death, and his resurrection. So thank you, God, that we can look to the promises you've made in Scripture, the some promises that you've already fulfilled and the ones that are yet to be fulfilled. God, that you would uh, help us to trust in you, to look to you and not ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, uh, questions? Make sense? At least a little bit? Do you want to say a bit about the alternatives? Yeah. Um, there's alternatives to this. Next question. Uh, yeah. I, I wish I had more um, than I would hand them out to everybody. So what this, what this little booklet is here um, is it gets into what we call dispensationalism, um, which essentially, I think it has a very clear and definition in here. Uh, I'll read it. It's right in the introduction. Dispensationalism is basically the method of interpreting the scriptures that sees two different, or excuse me, two distinct peoples of God with two distinct destinies, Israel and the church. And then he gives uh, a sort of list of tenets that describe what dispensationalism uh, really dives at. A couple of them are the church is not a continuation of God's Old Testament people. Essentially what it says is instead of God's unfolding plan of salvation, same plan, plan A, all through, and if you think about it, right, really until around here, right, we have this side of the New Covenant, we have Israel, and this side we have the church. And so a dispensational theology says, it doesn't necessarily deny that, that God makes covenant with his people. But what he says is that all of this here, that's a, that's a different plan. That's a different people group, a distinct people group that, that in a sense is unrelated to or different than in terms of God's plan for salvation, different than what we see here in the church. So it draws this distinction, which I would argue, and hopefully you see as well, an unnatural distinction between how God has chosen to save his people. Um, God did not set two different, there, there was not a, even if it's a plan A and plan A for two different groups, God's plan has always been the same. We saw that in Ephesians 1. God's plan to save his people, as it unfolds throughout redemptive history, there's no, there's no break in that line. It's not, okay, we did it with this group, now let's start over here. Um, it's all part of the same plan. And so what this booklet does, um, that I think is a helpful resource, it's uh, Nathan Pitchford, I gave you guys that one on, I wonder what it was called, uh, maybe the grace of God, or uh, anyways, the one on Calvinism. Uh, this one, what he does, he goes through the main tenets of what dispensationalism is, uh, which I think is helpful, because what it, what it will do is, is hopefully give you a good picture of uh, explaining it more clearly. And then the rest of the book goes through just scripture. And it gives some headings on what it's referring to. Um, but it's just scripture referring to how God's unfolding plan of salvation is actually done covenantally. Um, and so really it just unpacks more of what I said today, um, sort of in response to what dispensational theology teaches. Any other questions? All right. That's all I got. Thank you.